below in this tutorial we'll be learning Lua and this Lua tutorial is going to be fast paced the reason I made this is so that if people want to create a game pretty quickly and just want to learn Lua they can just come to this tutorial and they got their Lua skills up and running the first part of Lua we'll be learning is printing printing allows us to display things inside of the console let's look at this example the first one says welcome to the adventure the welcome to the adventure is going to be printed to the console and the next one says hello John the warrior so let's see what the console shows. As you can see, it prints out all the stuff that we want. So the printing is working. Next thing we're gonna learn is variables. Variables allows us to store data inside of human readable type of language. So we can easily call them and refer to them later. Let's look at this code example. The first variable we have, player name, is a string and it's gonna be equal to John the Warrior. The next variable we have is player level, which is a number, and it's gonna be equal to five. The next variable after that is going to be player has a weapon, which is a boolean, which could either be set to true or false. In this case, it's set to true, meaning that the player has a weapon. The next part we have is a player half. Then the player half is a number, again, which we can represent the half of the player. And the next part variable we have is weapon type. Weapon type is going to be a sword, which is a string, so we can use it. And the next one we have is player mana, which is 50. So we're going to allow us to print all these variables down here in the print statement. As you see there, we have a double point, uh, double periods over there, which is going to allow us to concatenate them. Concatenation basically allows us to join a string and another string or another variable together so that we can have one string together. And if we print it out, we will see this. Before we move forward, we're going to actually analyze what numbers can do in Lua. As you see in this example, we have the player level, the player half, and the player weapon strength. All of, each, all of them are going to be numbers. And in the player level, we're going to add one to it so that we can level up the player. And the next one is player half, which we minus it by 20, meaning that it took damage. Afterward, what we do for the player strength is that we go and we multiply it by two so it can we can enhance the weapon strength. Below, we can see there are extra stuff we can do like divide, raise to the power, and mod, which is just a remainder. If we take a division, and the remainder of that number will be the mod of it. And if we print out all the values, we get this result. The next thing we're going to do is condition statements. In this example, we have a player called Mary the Mage, and Mary the Mage has a level of 15. And in the if statement, this if statement allows us to check the condition. So the condition we want to check is if Mary's level, which is 15, is greater than or equal to 10. And if Mary's level is greater than or equal to 10, then Mary can enter into the Forbidden Forest. If Mary is not strong enough or is less than 10, her level is less than 10, then she's just not strong enough to enter the Forbidden Forest. And there are more comparisons below, which is less than, greater than, less than or equal to, or not equal to, and equal to. If we run the project, we can see that Mary can enter the Forbidden Forest because her level is 15, which is greater than or equal to 10. Let's go and look at another example of comparisons. This time we're going to add something called else if. As you see from this example, we have a player called Tim the Thief and his level is 25 and he does not have a weapon because it's equal to false. We actually have three types of comparison types. We have the if and then we have else if and then we have else. So what happens is that if the if statement fails, it goes to the else if and if the else if fails, then it goes to the else. What the if statement is checking if, if the player does not have a weapon and if the player's level is less than 10. The not keyword basically flips to whatever boolean value it has. So the player does it have a weapon, it's set to false. So it's not false, meaning that it's true. So this statement will, that first part of the statement will run. The and keyword basically checks to if both of the conditions on the left and the right side are complete. If both of them fit, then it will go down. So if it has to check if the player is less than 10 and the player is not less than 10, so this condition fails. Because the condition failed, it will go to the else if statement. In the else if statement, we check if the player's level is less than five 
or if the player's level is equal to 100. And uh, we check the player's level, which is 25. And if that's less than, is 25 less than five, and that's false. So we check the other one, is, is 25 equal to 100, that's false. So the all statement checks if, if either one of them is true, it would go down. But since both of them are false, it will go down to the else statement. If we run the project, we will see that the player does not need anything. Even though the player does not have a weapon, though the player's level is high, so it can look for the weapon itself and is strong enough to do so. Next thing we're going to look at is loops. The first loop we're going to look at is the while loop. What the while loop does is that it continues to run in a loop if a condition is met. In this example, we check if count is less than three. And if count continues to be less than three, then it will continue to loop. So we go down, count is beginning at zero, and then we go first down and it prepares a potion and then it count go increases by one and it continues to do it again and again and again until count is no longer less than three. So then it'll get out of the loop and then we'll stop preparing the potion. The next example we'll be looking at is for loops. For loops allows us to loop a condition a fixed number of times. In this example, we set the for loop start number to one and we make it loop until it reaches five. So it'll keep exploring the floors of the dungeon until it reaches the fifth floor. This other for loop is different. It has a number and it has a condition, which is one, but it also has negative two. This negative two shows what increment we should be moving the initial number from. So initial number is 10. So we will be minusing it by two each time it goes to the loop. So it will be 10 and it will loop again. And the next one will be eight and then six and then downward. So basically we're gonna loop it in floors by twos so that you'll be going up the dungeon by twos and not by ones no more. Next concept we'll be talking about is functions. Functions allows us to run a small chunk of code with the given parameters and so we can we can organize our code into smaller chunks instead of making a large chunk of everything. This is the first example of functions we'll be talking about. In this function, we breed the player and we pass in a name and a level. The name and the level is the parameter of the functions and this parameter is what us, the user, puts in. So in the name, we basically greet the player, greetings, and then the player's name, and then we say your level is, and then in the level or number we have before. So underneath is an example of how we use the function. We basically plug in the name Alice the Archer and the level 10, and as it prints out, greetings Alice the Archer, you are at level 10. In this function, we calculate the damage of the weapon. It takes in the weapon strength and the level as the parameters. But what it does, is it returns an output, a return statement, basically just an output of what we want to return. And what it returns is the weapon strength multiplied by the level. So underneath we have an example, we put the weapon strength as five and the level as 10. And what the output will be is 50. So the total damage dealt will be 50. Now we're going to go into tables. The first type of table we'll be talking about is a list. In this variable, we have an inventory, which is a list of stuff that we have. So we have a potion, we have a shield and a sword, which are all going to be in the inventory. And what we're printing out is the first element of the inventory. The element start from number one, unlike in other language, which starts from zero, lower starts at number one. And the next example is we're going to insert something inside of the list. So we insert a bow and the next thing we do is print out the bow because the bow is in the fourth position. We just print out the new element is a bow. Underneath we see a for loop, but this for loop is kind of special. This for loop is meant to loop over lists. So the first thing I is it refers to the index of the number we have in the list, either number one, number two, it keeps going on. And, and then the next one is item, which is the value of the list, potion, shield, and then et cetera. And then in, we basically check each of these values inside of the list. I pairs basically allows us to loop in incremented numbers. So since this is a number, number one is potion, number two is shield, we keep looping from number one all the way to the end of the list. That's what I pairs represents. And we put the list in the parameters. And what we do is it prints out all the stuff inside of the inventory. I want to quickly show you how to get the size of a list. So if we look at this example, we see that we have a party and it has a warrior, a mage and an archer. So the way we get the size of a list is by having the hash key and then we put party. Then we put the name of the list. So we have hash and then party and it will print out the number of party members and it will say three. So that's how you get the size of a list. 
Next thing we're going to talk about is dictionaries. Dictionaries allows us to store key value pairs inside of lists. For this example, we have the player stats. So before we were using player name, player level, but this time we can just put it inside of one list called player stats. And in this in this type of um, dictionary, we store the name, which is Eve the Elf. Then we store the level, which is 12, and then the health, then the mana, then the weapon. And as you can see, the way we add a new element of the dictionary is putting a comma and then the next equal sign. And then what we're going to do is we're going to print out the name of the player and then the level of the player. And then we'll increase the level of the player by one. And then we'll just print out the new level. Underneath, we see a for loop. This for loop is special, like the last one, but slightly different. Instead of saying I pairs, it says pairs. Pairs allows us to get a key value pair of the list. So the name and then the, the value of the name and then the health level and then the value of the level. So if we print out all these stuff, we can see that the stat, it will print out the stat name and then the stat value. A table can actually store in another table. So this table, a party, is a list. And in the party, it has inside of other lists of a bunch of players. So Leon the Lion, Mary the Mage, Jake the Rogue, and we see all their stats. And underneath we have a for loop, which uses I pairs because we're using a, a list and not a dictionary, but a list. And this just loops out all the party members, their names and their levels. One thing you might be noticing is that we have to constantly be create a new list if we want to make a player, which is kind of inefficient. It'd be cool if we could just have a way to easily do this. So over here is a function that can easily generate a player. So what it does, it, it returns a list of uh, with all, a new player and all the stats. So the stats of the player, the player name, the level, the health, the weapon, it will be outputted from this function. And as you see down here, we're creating the first player, which is Leon the Lion, and then the next player, Mina the Mage, and we give them all their weapons and all that stuff inside of the parameters. And then we're gonna, underneath, we're gonna print out all their stats they have. It's cool that we have players and they have stats, but it would be kind of cool if players could do something. So over here, we have an example table of a dictionary of everything we want. So we have an attack and then we have heal. And as you can see, the attack, they're assigned to a function. So variables can actually be assigned to a function if we want them to be able to do something. So we see that the player has an attack function. And then you have to say you see self and then you also see target. So the self is actually something special when it comes to Lua. Self is basically the first element it is assigned when you have a function. So as you see here, the self will basically be what the player is. So it'll just be the player represented itself. So the target will basically be who we're uh, trying to attack with our attack. And then the heal also takes in the self and self will just be the player, like the, the stats of the player, which is it has a name and then it has a uh, health, you know, all those type of stuff we set from the top. So we're going to go back to that create player function we created before. And what we're going to do is instead of returning it, we're going to actually make it into a variable and we're going to call it new player. And if you see here, you see a local keyword. Local allows us to keep the variable inside of the function. Usually um, Lua makes it global. So every where you go, you can actually access the variable, but we don't want that to happen. We just want to be inside of the function. So we put a local keyword and we basically create a new player and we see something called set meta table. So set meta table is a special type of variable, a special type of type that Lua provide, which allows us to extract and do extra stuff with a table. So the index allows us to take something from, um, from another table and use them, add them to a table. So basically we have in the player function above, we basically had the attack and heal. What the index function will do is that inside of the new player we just created, we will add the attack function and the heal function. So basically they'll be combined together using that index function. So basically the player will now be able to attack and be able to heal. And as you saw from the self, I saw I wrote self, that self will basically be the new player object we put created over there. So every place we see self, we can just imagine it to be the new player. So it can have new player dot name, new player dot level, and all these type of stuff. It's the, what the self function did in the top function. And now we just return the player. And then underneath we see us using a player. We have Leon the lion and Mina the mage. And over here we have an attack function. We put a colon, we put a colon and then we put attack and then we're just gonna attack number two. 
a player is going to attack number player number two, and then player two is going to be heal itself. So as you see, we can now have functions, and the players can interact with one another. One thing to note is that you can see in the attack function, you only have one parameter. While up there, there was two. While the self um, keyword is not written because the self is automatically added and it's just going to be player one. It's automatically added when we add the colon feature. If we add a dot, then we would have to plug in the new player. But since we use colon, it adds the player one as the self automatically without us writing self. So the same goes to here. We just leave the parameters empty because self is already added for us because we use the colon key and not the dot. The next thing we'll be talking about is math. Math is an important part of law, which can help us calculate some solutions to our problems. This section does not teach you how to do math, but it just shows you what math functions are available if you want to code. Let's look at this example. In this example, we have a base damage, which is equal to 120.75, and then a critical multiplier, and then critical damage, which is basically base damage multiplied by critical multiplier. As you can see, base damage and critical multiplier, they have decimals. So they are types of numbers, which are floats. So floats have decimals. And if we go to the print statement, we see that we're printing out the critical damage and we're rounding it up and then also rounding it down. The first part is using math.floor. Math.floor basically rounds down a percentage. Basically, you can think of it removing the percentage. So for base, if we have base damage and we want to round, uh, make a floor of it, it will be equal to 120. And if we round up using the math.seal, it will be 121. So floor is used to round down and seal is used to round up. In this next example, we have a min level and a max level. And what we want to do is calculate a random number to be the new enemy level. So we use math.random and then we put the min level and then the max level. And it calculates a random number between the numbers 5 and 10. So the, number, the enemy level could be 7, it could be 8, it could be 9, depending on whatever is there. So that's how we can get a random number. And then we just print out the enemy level. In this next example, we have a mana, which is 64, and we have spell range, which is actually equal to the square root of the mana, which is 64. So the square root of 64 is 8. So the way we do the square root is math.square root We're using this, and then we're just going to print out the spell range. In this next example, we have an angle, which is 45. And now what we're going to do is calculate the radiance of the angle using math.rand. And then we take the speed, which is 30, and next, what we're going to do is we're going to find the x distance, the distance of the arrow. And what we do is we multiply it by math.cosine of the radiance. Cosine takes in a radiance, not a degree. And for the y distance, it's speed times math.sine and then the radiance. So this is just the basic stuff you use for the unit circle. If you know about that, it should be useful to know that there's sine and cosine in Lua. And what we're doing is just printing out the result down below. Though I do want to say that there is math.degree if you want to convert a radiance into a degree, you just write math.degree and then put the radiance angle and it'll convert it to a degree. That wraps up this short tutorial. Of course, there are a lot more we can do, but I just wanted to make it pretty quickly so that if suppose you have a tutorial in Love2D and you just don't know how to use Lua, and this can be a very good tutorial. And if you want to share and like and subscribe, thank you and have a good day.